One of the worst crimes against humanity committed by the Third Reich is rightly considered the establishment of concentration camps, both in its own territory and on the territories of the occupied states. Auschwitz and Buchenwald, these names cannot be pronounced today without a shiver in our voice. In fact, the destruction of the camp system went hand in hand with the collapse of the whole Nazi system. Thousands of prisoners tearfully welcomed the liberation warriors symbolizing their deliverance from terrible torment. But for a long time the images of the humiliation and suffering they were forced to endure linger in the minds of the distressed people. The First Women's Death Camp Heinrich Himmler personally supervised the construction of the Ravensbrück, which later became one of the largest camps in terms of the number of prisoners. According to his idea, the future prison had to admit only women to its prisons. While serving their sentences, they were employed in the textile industry within the camp, namely in sewing clothes for prisoners. The barracks, where the first batch of prisoners began to be housed, were built and handed over in May of 1939. The barracks had a capacity of 6,000 people in total and initially housed only German women prisoners. But the expansion that began demanded much more prison space. About 900 of the prisoners were selected to build additional barracks as well as barracks for the soldiers. The number of prisoners increased rapidly as new buildings were put into construction. Now it was not only Germans but also women of other nationalities who were brought in large numbers from the occupied territories. Ravensburg gradually expanded into a whole network of transit camps, death camps, forced labor camps and so-called subcamps. And pretty soon the number of prisoners was over 10,000, and by 1943 already over 15,000 people. Most of the prisoners were women, but there were also special barracks for men and even children. The Horrors of Ravensbrück As the number of prisoners grew, conditions and the treatment of prisoners steadily became worse. All new arrivals to the camp were first of all taken out into the yard for an initial examination where they were stripped completely, and the guards were absolutely not interested in what the weather was like. The medical examinations were also incredibly rude, especially the gynecologists, who were unceremonious and inflicted severe pain on the girls. After a settlement, the camp routine followed. The girls were awakened at 4 a.m., given half a cup of coffee, and led out into the yard for roll call. During the roll call, the day's work was announced. In some cases, verification was deliberately prolonged. Some women could not withstand standing for a long time, especially in inclement weather, and the extended inspections were held mainly on exactly such days, and so they fell down. Immediately, the warders, sometimes with dogs, pounced on them and began to beat them brutally. Often after this, the victims were no longer able to work and, accordingly, were soon sent to the gas chamber. After a roll call, the girls went to their jobs. The shift was usually between 12 to 14 hours. During this time, the girls were allowed only one single break, during which they had lunch. It could not be called a complete meal. Each worker was given a plate of so-called soup, half a liter of water with potato peels. And even that was only for the day. The night shift took place without any breaks or meals. In addition to the mandatory inspections at the beginning and end of the day, additional inspections were constantly conducted. For example, an examination of the appearance of the prisoners. Although the uniforms were issued only once upon arrival at the camp, the regulations demanded that they be clean and tidy at all times. The girls were subjected to additional punishments for dirty shoes and torn clothes. They were whipped, locked up in disciplinary cells and deprived of supper. All these humiliations had much more of a psychological than a physical impact on the inmates. The battered and oppressed women became much more submissive and more controlled. Both the commandant and the warders, who were chosen from people who had received special training for work in the concentration camps, understood all of this very well. Their main task was to strictly enforce the unbearable regime, and they coped with this perfectly well. A hell full of experiments. But the real nightmares for the unfortunate prisoners began when a special medical complex was opened on the campgrounds. 
This is because its staff was not engaged in the treatment of prisoners, but rather in the most brutal experiments, which tortured a large number of people to death. The main purpose of the killer doctors was to find out how the body reacts to all kinds of wounds and diseases. To this purpose, the subjects were deliberately mutilated, almost always bringing the experiments to a lethal stage. But one of the first experiments was to study the body's reaction to the introduction of foreign objects into wounds. The skin was cut on the calves of the legs, pathogenic bacteria were initially introduced into the wound as a reaction agent, and the wood shavings or even broken glass were put inside the wound. In this way, the model of a combat wound was fully reproduced. The doctors then closely monitored the inflammatory processes and used various therapeutic techniques to neutralize them. No one of these Nazi doctors cared that the girls experienced terrible agony. Pain relief was prohibited in this experiment. Considerable attention was paid to the study of endurance. Prisoners were specially selected into groups according to their age and physical characteristics and were forced to perform an enormous number of heavy exercises. The workload was gradually increased until people were exhausted and literally fell down. The results were recorded and those who were exhausted and therefore more unfit for work were sent to the gas chambers. One of the most vicious experiments was the transplantation of limbs. The process consisted of amputating legs or arms, which were transplanted to other test subjects. Anesthesia was practically never used, so the unfortunate women experienced absolutely inhuman suffering. At the end of the experiments, they were given lethal injections and their bodies were burned. The long-known German practicality even manifested itself in the following. For example, it was not uncommon for new prisoners who were pregnant to be brought into the camp. Immediately, local so-called doctors developed a course on how to terminate pregnancies at various stages. Often, the unborn fetus was still alive by the end of the experiments, but was nevertheless immediately destroyed. The Nazis, true to the basic idea of creating conditions for the degeneration of unnecessary people, made Ravensbrück nearly the main platform for practicing different methods of sterilization. And one of the obligatory conditions was that the test subjects had to be able to return to their working state fairly quickly. Initially, variants with injections of Novocaine, barium sulfate, and formalin were tested. Sterilization was carried out, but the women did not recover from these preparations. Then they tried X-rays. This kind of experience led to radiation, but was generally found to be more effective. This is not a complete list of the horrifying and inhumane experiments. Freezing experiments were conducted to study more clearly the process of resuscitation, transplantation of nerve and muscle tissues, and many others. Often, doctors would simply kill sick prisoners with lethal injections, or give them a pill, which was said to be the cure. Overall, at least 70,000 people died in the camp's prisons during its existence, and at least a quarter of them were tortured during the most brutal experiments. The camp firmly ranked among the highest death tolls of its prisoners, second only to the Flossenburg concentration camp. The End of Camp in the last days of April, the leadership of Ravensbrück began to receive very disappointing news. The Allied armies continued to confidently crush the remnants of the Wehrmacht soldiers and were rapidly advancing in a westward direction. The camp commandant and the garrison did not wait for their arrival and, having hurriedly evacuated some 20,000 prisoners to Malko, one of the outer corps of Ravensbrück, themselves fled. The prisoners were released on April 30th. Subscribe for more videos.